So without further ado, to kick off this final day, we are very excited to welcome Kathleen Long, Vice President of Animal Care for Maple Leaf Foods Incorporated. And her talk is entitled Animal Welfare in Practice. Welcome, Kathleen. Great, thanks, Vicki. I will share my screen like we practiced. Let me know if that's not the way we want it. Looks good. Good. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, Canadian Poultry Research Forum. Um, I'd like to pass on a congratulations to Frank Ra Robinson for his recognition yesterday and just let you all know that I am yet another one of the Frank Robinson team that he introduced me into poultry and here I am. So very grateful for that and very well deserved Frank. Um, so a little bit of background. Um, I joined Maple Leaf in 2013 as one of our poultry vets and now in the animal care role. So I'm responsible for our animal welfare programs across our pork and poultry operations, and then uh, anything to do with suppliers, customers, um, sort of corporate programs, um, dealing with interest groups, and that sort of thing is all uh, my area of responsibility. Um, and just in case anybody's not really familiar with our structure, um, we have three broiler hatcheries and five chicken processing plants. And we also own a bit of pullet and hatching egg production. And then everything else, um, hatching eggs, as well as um, broiler production, we, we're working with independent farmers who supply our operations. Um, and we also work with independent turkey farmers through uh, procurement contracts. So that's, I guess, the context that I'm coming from. And also, um, because of that, I'm really going to focus on broilers today. So in terms of the agenda, I'll talk a little bit about the poultry industry and our broiler standards, who cares about animal welfare, give you an industry perspective or perhaps more my personal perspective on current issues in broiler welfare and then some opportunities that I think exist. So I did understand that we may have some people who are not so familiar with the Canadian industry structure. So very briefly, um, we are mostly non-vertically integrated. So farmers purchase chicks from a hatchery and then they sell them to a processor. And the processor may or may not be the same company as the hatchery. And because of this, we really rely on um, our relationships and, and product quality to maintain um, our working relationship with farmers, as opposed to um, a very much contract-driven, vertically integrated system. And um, farmers must own quota to produce commercial poultry in Canada. Um, so that means that they are allocated a certain amount of production for each uh, growing cycle, and that can be adjusted from cycle to cycle based on market conditions. And then compensation is standardized based on a cost of production formula. And there are a ton of benefits to having this supply management system. It means that we have stable supply and pricing of poultry. It means that we have a very strong regulatory basis to ensure compliance. And it enables us to have mandatory on-farm food safety and animal care programs for all of our commercial poultry farmers. So um, that's something that we're really proud of. One of the challenges that comes from this structure is that even though many of the customers of processors like us understand and respect and value our non-integrated structure, they still sometimes expect us to be able to deliver outcomes or information that you might expect more from a, an integrated company. In terms of broiler welfare standards in Canada, um, we have the National Farm Animal Care Council codes of practice. Those are developed through a very robust process that starts with a scientific review and then proceeds into a code development process, which involves multiple stakeholders, for instance, vets, um, animal or humane uh, groups, farmers, industry groups, and so on. And then those programs, once they're in the code, <clears throat> excuse me, are incorporated into the national species programs. So in this case, the Chicken Farmers of Canada Animal Care Program, um, and that's certified as matching the code. And then it is made mandatory for all of our farmers. And so the farmers are audited by board staff in each province. Um, and then there's third party auditing nationally to ensure overall effective implementation 
of the program. So who cares about animal welfare? Yeah, I'm sure everybody will debate me that I missed somebody or I bucketed them wrong, but um, it's probably intuitive that the majority of the members of the poultry industry have a vested interest in the welfare of our animals. So that includes primary breeders, farmers, uh, hatchery processor, vet, all of our service providers and allied industry that we work with. And of course, the industry associations and the CFIA, our regulator. However, there's also a lot of external stakeholders who have a lot of uh, influence because of how much they care about animal welfare. So this includes retail and for food service companies. So those are the customers of someone like Maple Leaf. Um, the consuming public, they expect us to treat animals well. Um, our shareholders, investor groups, um, ranking bodies such as the business benchmark on farm animal welfare, uh, welfare groups, there's many, but for instance, NFAC. And then animal interest groups, I've, I've lumped them, but obviously exist across a broad spectrum of objectives from animal rights to not so much animal rights. And then there are a lot of external standard setting bodies. So for instance, GAP, Global Animal Partnership, or Humane Farm Animal Care, these third party um, accredited or standard setting organizations that will certify animal welfare programs. So um, even though these parties are somewhat external, they have just a massive influence on what we are doing. So how do external stakeholders influence animal welfare? And it's in a variety of ways. This is just a, a small example or a small set of examples. So um, the business benchmark on farm animal welfare is a, a ranking organization. So they evaluate publicly available information about 150 different companies, which includes um, sort of general business practices as well as um, numerical performance related items. So for instance, they have a question on slow growing breeds. So what percent of your chicken production is slow growing breeds? And then your, your assessed points based on that. Um, and then they publish this ranking publicly and um, they're associated with an investor group and then the public, our customers and our shareholders can all see this. Um, another example is the Mercy for Animals Canadian scorecard, which came out for the first time last year. So they ranked um, several Canadian companies based on uh, broiler chicken, laying hen, and sow housing commitments and achievement um, and broke them into tiers. So, I, you know, I've only copied in the first page there, but if I'm someone in one of the lower tiers, um, I may be thinking, what can I do to advance my standing in the next year? <clears throat> Um, third here is just a, a snippet of companies that have signed on to the Better Chicken Commitment, and I'll talk about that in a minute um, in more detail, but um, I think it's a really uh, important example about how of how these organizations exert their influence. So um, it can range from any, and sorry, the way that they are doing this is by asking companies to sign on to this commitment. So they, they exert that influence. And it could be anything from meeting with the company, convincing them, then they sign on and it's all very innocuous. Or it could be pretty aggressive campaigns that involve undercover videos, um, protests at your site. It could be protests at the homes of, of individuals from the company. They will reach out to board members or people who are connected to your board members. And it can get pretty ugly. So you can see where some companies just reach this point of like, what do I need to do to make the pressure stop? And often that results in signing on to these commitments. And in some cases, um, people that have signed on don't necessarily know or understand the implications of what they've signed on for. So what does that mean for someone like Maple Leaf or for me? It means we get a lot of surveys. So customers are always sending us very detailed. You'd be surprised how detailed the surveys are um, and this uh, serves the purpose of providing them animal welfare information from their suppliers that they incorporate into their reporting, as well as some, I guess, benchmarking. It allows them to baseline where their state, where their suppliers are at. And then eventually 
those normally turn into requirements of suppliers and um, we are serving customers and then th that influence sort of filters down through the industry. So just spend a moment on the Better Chicken commitment. Um, this came out as a joint request by several humane and animal interest, animal rights groups um, as one consolidated set of, of requirements to advance animal welfare. So version one is that you will sign up for Global Animal Partnership or GAP, um, which incorporates all of these individual items. Or version two is that you sign on to a set of requirements as listed, which include low stocking density, um, environmental improvements, including certain litter characteristics, lighting, including 50 lux light intensity and um, six hours of continuous darkness, environmental enrichments, controlled atmosphere stunning, uh, a third party auditing program. And then by 2026, uh, use of higher welfare breeds. Um, and currently all of the breeds that qualify under that list are slow growing breeds. So there are a lot of implications um, to our industry if we're trying to achieve these standards. So again, this is an industry perspective, but perhaps a, a, a Kathleen perspective. Um, but I wanted to highlight some of the current broad challenges that I see in meeting these asks that are coming to us. First is continuous improvement. So the NFAC process and our national programs are so robust and they're very well respected, but partly that brings the consequence of being somewhat onerous to uh, update and updates become infrequent. The external landscape for animal welfare, including litter or scientific advancement, um, the asks of customers, those are all changing somewhat faster than our programs are. And I really worry that we lose credibility if our programs are falling behind. So I think improving a bit more quickly is something we need to focus on. Next is transparency. Um, customers have a high expectation for transparency and we really don't report in that way today through the national programs, either through the provinces or through the national associations. Um, I really believe if you don't report it, you didn't do it. We can make a lot of public commitments, but if we don't state what we have achieved against those commitments, it, it doesn't mean a lot. So um, I think there's an opportunity to increase transparency, to build trust in those customers and in the public. And like I mentioned before, we fill out a lot of surveys. Uh, next is achieving scientific consensus. Um, there is, I would say, a lack of consensus on a number of important welfare issues, especially those that are new or very much evolving, um, are multifactorial in nature, and that makes it difficult to make informed decisions. There's also the impact of other standards. So, for instance, uh, 30 kilograms per meter squared density has become so common with the better chicken commitment and um, say the EU and the UK are ahead of us in that way that a lot of the available literature on different welfare uh, standards is always at 30 kgs per meter squared. So that makes it a little bit harder to apply it to a system where we have higher density. And lastly, um, validating under commercial barn conditions is so important. Finally, return on investment can be tough for animal welfare. Some, some initiatives and improvements most certainly improve your financial outcomes, but not all of them do. It can be difficult to improve what drives the bottom line at the plant, it yields, um, reducing trim loss, um, improving uniformity, all of those, reducing condem condemns. Um, those are important to show a return on investment. We don't always have those from all welfare in the, in initiatives, and that can make selling them a bit tough. And frankly, customers expect us to provide a high standard of welfare because it's the right thing to do without paying more for it. So that can make pricing for welfare tough. All right, so I'll move on to what I think are some of the most pressing welfare issues. Um, and the first is stocking density. It really is a complex issue. And I think that's clearly evidenced by the fact that Canada as well as other places often have tiered standards. So 
in Canada, it's either a maximum of 31 kgs per meter squared or up to 38 if you meet a list of additional welfare provisions. And this is, I can't, I can't emphasize enough, this is a huge focus of customers and animal interest groups. We get inquiries all the time about this. So it's, it's only becoming more and more of a focus. The data is pretty difficult to obtain. It's not something we access through our associations. We have to figure that out individually as processors to be able to report it. Um, we did support a trial at the U of S and we observed linear improvements in foot pads, litter moisture, fear, and growth at lower densities where the lowest density was 31 and also improvements at 34. So you know, I wasn't, um, trying to present all of the research findings in this presentation, but if you want to talk about that further, just feel free to contact me after. Um, the next issue I wanted to speak about is enrichment. Um, environmental enrichments are items that you add in the environment to promote highly motivated species-specific behaviors, and that in turn promotes positive welfare states. So we've done a number of barn or commercial barn level trials and some of our observations are a reduction in severe foot pad lesions, um, increased femur and tibia bone weight and bone ash. And we saw a lot of behavioral changes. So um, generally increased activity and pecking behavior, as well as increased perching and comfort behaviors um, in relation to those enrichments. We've also seen some improvement in feed intake during brooding as reported by farmers. So if you have an object such as the one at the top, top left or at the bottom, birds will go under there and clean up the feed under those items first, um, and then you can move them around. Um, I'd say for broilers, we're a little bit behind the curve, to be honest, on enrichments. It's already incorporated into other codes of practice. It's mandatory in the pig code. Um, there are a lot of recommendations in the layer code, obviously with enriched housing. So um, I think this is a relatively easy way to improve welfare, and, and I hope that it catches on um, in our broiler production in Canada. The next issue is lighting, which is just really tough, frankly. There is a lack of consistent, consistency in lighting requirements and recommendations across the board, and I know many of you are doing work on lighting, and we very much value that in, in industry. So for example, um, the better chicken commitment and gap require 50 lux light intensity versus other standards range from five to five to 10 in the code or 20 for a number of standards. So a, a great range there. And there's also a lot of focus on natural lighting in particular in other countries. So it's almost forget about lux and focus on natural lighting. So that I think is a really interesting question because it brings in the issue of worker benefits. Um, I think it's really easy to approach that and say, like, we're most fo focused on the welfare of the birds and the worker benefits are less important and should not weigh into that as much. But I think it's very true that we'll see better um, attention and time in the barn if, if workers enjoy the environment. So we shouldn't totally ignore it, but definitely weight it appropriately. And there are a number of new areas of focus, including different color spectra and gradient lighting that we're not at a point of understanding well enough to, to put into broad standards, or maybe we will hear soon that we, we understand those pretty well, but it hasn't filtered through to industry yet. Um, lastly is breeds. Um, breeds are a, a tough topic. There is definitely some research showing that slow growing breeds improve behavior, mobility, foot pad health, leg and hawk health and mortality. Um, however, there's limited replication of what's available. And when you combine that with the fact that there are truly massive environmental and sustainability impacts, that makes it tough to, to make changes. Um, for instance, depending on the breed you select, you're looking at like a 25 to 50% or greater increase in feed, land, water, and barn space requirements to go to slow growing breeds. And it, it really is a debilitating financial impact. So um, certainly a lot of scientific substantiation is necessary to drive a, a change of that magnitude. 
And of course, there's always this question of how slow is slow enough. So do you want slow enough to satisfy the requirements of the better chipping commitment? Or do you want this um, sort of colored heritage breed outside in this pastoral setting that um, sometimes people envision uh, when they're, they're at the counter in the store buying chicken. So it's a very um, difficult topic. So now moving along to some opportunities. Um, I see a big opportunity being in changing the narrative to move beyond biological functioning. I'm sure most of you are familiar with David Fraser's Three Circles. Um, ways of looking at welfare, including biological functioning, effective state, and natural living. Um, and historically, animal production has focused quite a bit on biological functioning. And I think a lot of our, our farmer base and our industry base are um, sort of in that mentality. Um, this is evidenced by the fact that the five freedoms have been the predominant welfare standard um, for several decades now, and they're really focused on preventing negative states so that animals function option optimally. Um, we've taken the approach of moving toward the five domains model. Um, I will be the first to admit it's a pretty complex model if you really get into the nuts and bolts of the assessment framework, um, but at a conceptual level, it really helps us to define why and how we make changes. So, um, now you're able to assess items on a continuum that spans from negative to positive welfare outcomes. Um, and it more heavily emphasizes the importance and the impact of mental state and how um, physical domains can interact with mental well being to affect the overall mental state. Um, a more recent addition is behavioral interaction. So the model also um, incorporates that interactions can affect the, the welfare state of animals. Um, the next opportunity I wanted to highlight is around sensors and data analytics. And I know you heard about big data yesterday, probably multiple times throughout the session. Um, and the same holds true for animal welfare. I think this is really where we're headed. There have been so many advancements in sensor technology. So for example, you can use barn cameras to measure activity levels. Um, there is complex environmental monitoring, so it's no longer these disparate sensors. You can have monitoring of temperature, humidity, ammonia, CO2, um, all in, in one spot. So you can identify sort of environmental dead spots or, or how you can improve your environment. Um, there's measurement for vocalization, for temperature, and, and the list goes on. So as a vet, it makes me really excited. If there's a way for us to use sensor technology to identify, say, a couple of days earlier that a flock is about to have an illness, we can intervene sooner and hopefully minimize the impacts. And of course, the value here is not in what are relatively cheap sensors in the long run. It's in the algorithms to assess that data. So this can help us to look at historical data and um, separate out what we think may be causative from what is more likely to be causative and make changes and also um, move to predictive analytics. So if we know what the risk factors are, we can take changes or take actions in advance to prevent adverse welfare or health outcomes or whatever the case is. Um, the challenge here is it, it's a huge shift. We're talking about shifting from paper barn cards to all digital inputs. And of course, in our non-integrated system, like I mentioned earlier, everybody's got dis different systems and we don't have sort of one uh, consolidated way of incorporating that information. But I'm sure we've all heard the statement on the right, you manage what you measure and we need to find ways to um, utilize all of these measurements that we're now able to obtain. Uh, next is tiered animal welfare programs as an opportunity. Um, I think that historically we've really focused in Canada on having a consistent standard. This is the standard that we, we live by is, is well substantiated and that's how we approach our national programs. However, there are um, already some examples of tiers within there. So for instance, um, the NFAT codes all have requirements and they have recommendations. 
um, in broiler welfare, we have two stocking density standards. Uh, there are a number of branded programs like uh, certified humane on the shelf, there's organic, there's raised without antibiotics. So this is coming up in different ways. Um, it's just not structured really formally, but it is what we're seeing as an approach in other countries to meet changing customer requirements. Um, so I, I just give the example here of Red Tractor in the UK. Um, there are the certified standards, which are like conventional um, and enhanced welfare, which is um, like an, an indoor welfare standard. It's more or less consistent with the better chicken commitment. And then there's a free range standard. So I think this is an important way to facilitate stepwise improvement um, without sort of overburdening the industry with massive changes. And at this point, Industry really has, an, and when I say industry, I guess I mean the, the national standards, we really have an opportunity to own this and structure it. Um, and if we don't, we're just going to continue to see uh, disparate programs and standards creeping up um, to meet those customer requirements. So I think there's a big opportunity here. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about the opportunity for people to work as welfare specialists. I know we have a number of grad students on here. I'm assuming some of you are interested in welfare. And I do wanna tell you, this is a good time to be interested in working in animal welfare. Um, since I started in 2013, I think pretty near every uh, body under the poultry industry list has either added or added new or additional welfare roles, including the breeder companies, um, hatcheries, processors, um, as vets, uh, the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association has several resources dedicated to welfare. Um, you know, our catching company has a welfare lead, pharmaceutical companies have welfare leads, um, and it's obviously very important to our feather boards and industry associations and to the CFIA. Externally, they all have welfare specialists too, in particular speaking about um, the retail and food service companies. Like often it's, it's somebody who has joint responsibility also for sustainability and maybe other elements, but uh, many of our customers have someone with dedicated knowledge and responsibility related to animal welfare. Um, I'd say there's a big opportunity for people who are knowledgeable from the industry to fill those roles. Um, I'm sure there's examples, but I would say perhaps less so the public shareholders and investor groups um, are having animal welfare opportunities. But when you look down the list at the ranking groups, welfare groups like NFAC, um, the broad spectrum of animal interest groups, and of course, standard setting bodies, they all heavily rely on people with knowledge in animal welfare. So um, I hope you all feel confident that you are in entering the industry at a time when welfare knowledge is really important. So um, with that, I will just close off with what I think is a, a balanced approach to advancing welfare in Canada and the considerations that we need to include as we look at doing this. So um, first is continuous advancement of the NFAT codes and national programs. As I mentioned earlier, we need to improve um, to maintain our credibility. Next is research to substantiate those welfare standards. We need to know that we're, we're signing up for the right standards. Third is to validate those using welfare outcome measures. And it's probably something I should have spoken about more is, is welfare outcomes. Um, there's a lot of, I think, opportunity to improve our knowledge and understanding of what those most important measures are and how to implement them in a practical manner. And lastly, um, we have a, a responsibility to defend against misguided standards. And what I mean by that are standards that um, perhaps promote welfare conditions that are high risk to the animals or which carry just completely unacceptable sustainability outcomes. Um, but the, the point I'd like to make is that to have the credibility to defend, we also need to do these other parts. We need to show advancement um, and we need to substantiate what we're doing so that when the time comes to defend, we're, we're in a balanced way and it's not only defense mode. 
I think all of these combined help us to maintain consumer trust, public trust, um, the, the faith of our customers, and um, maintain the sustainability of our industry from a, a welfare standpoint. And it is uh, an important function of doing business. Um, welfare standards are critical and we need to protect that. We need to protect the welfare standards to ensure that we are maintaining our industry viability. So with that, I will finish off and see if there are any questions discussion. Thank you, Kathleen. That was excellent and very interesting. And I am monitoring the um, Q&A box. And the first question we have is from your perspective, how much of the current discussion around welfare is actually about evidence-based improvements in animal well-being versus trying to achieve an aesthetic? Um, comment goes on to say, I listened recently to an interview with the leader of a major welfare organization in the U.S. involved in the several of the state initiatives to ban cage layers who admitted that their proposed standards far exceeded anything supported by research. I think it's a really important question and a topic that we all grapple with. Um, I think it's important, and I probably should have said this early on, is it's important to take into account that a number of those organizations asking and influencing have an objective of putting us out of business. That being said, a lot of organizations are um, firmly committed to improving the welfare of farmed animals. So I think it is incumbent upon the industry to find that middle ground. And we have a tendency to go into defense mode where we don't actually clearly substantiate the middle ground, but we push back against the um, sort of far reaching standards. So um, I think that's a, it's a really tough problem. It speaks in particular, I think that example was from the US. It also speaks to the ability in the US to put forward um, state ballot initiatives that are driven by humane organizations that have a, an, a, an animal rights based objective and those are able to really gain a stronghold. So um, that is a, a sort of unique feature of the US legal system and how they're able to put forward standards. So I would hope that in Canada, we can use the, the systems that we have with NFAC and our national programs to avoid going down that road and still remain very much science-based. Thank you for that. Just a reminder that if you have questions for Kathleen to please enter them in the Q&A box. Um, and while we're waiting, um, I have a question for you about the link uh, between welfare and other areas such as environment and climate change. And you refer to big data and precision agriculture in your presentation. Um, what we're seeing is uh, an increased uh, weight being put on environment and climate change research, by example, for example, by the federal government. And um, I'm just wondering if you can comment on the potential link between uh, welfare outcomes, uh, measuring welfare, and the potential benefits for also monitoring outcomes that may be beneficial in terms of environment and climate change and poultry production. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I think it's a tough topic because probably more often than not, they are at odds with one another. Um, but measuring those outcomes is the way that we can reach the balance point, I think. Um, and we, like, in our structure, our sustainability lead is in the same team as me. And sometimes I put forward things that worsen his results. And, and he challenges me on animal welfare initiatives that will uh, put at risk our sustainability results. But um, I think that's where it's most important to be focused on the outcomes to weigh the uh, benefits and drawbacks of each and establish sort of minimum thresholds that cannot be compromised in either area. What are the guiding principles or the, the minimum acceptable where we cannot compromise too far in one direction or the other in each of those areas? So Tough topic, Vicki. Sorry. You know. <laughs> Although I did enjoy picturing you and your sustainability lead 
you know, getting into the ring and maybe fighting it out a little bit, right? Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so again, if you guys have questions, now is your chance. This is a great opportunity, you guys. Um, I will pose uh, another question here around, um, you mentioned your four main challenges and, uh, you know, I would completely agree, stocking density, enrichment, lighting, and breeds. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on um, communication and tech transfer as perhaps uh, an overarching um, challenge with some of these areas, because you can do the work in these areas, but if the information is not available either to producers or the consuming public, um, it may not receive the attention that it deserves. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about um, the communication that's involved in, in some of this work, aside from some of the research that's, that's done to validate these outcomes and how do we get the message out essentially? Um, yeah, it's a, a really important topic. We can lose a lot of good information if we can't communicate it across. I think when we're talking about communicating to farmers, um, finding the people that communicate with a lot of farmers is really helpful. So um, prioritizing communication to our tech service industry. Um, those individuals are very knowledgeable. They meet with a lot of farmers and they have the ability to, you know, work with um, open-minded people who are willing to try new things and then build some, uh, I guess, evidence in the field that this is working and then spread it further. So I see those people as a really important, um, I guess, focal point for where we should address our tech transfer when you're looking at the farm level. When we're looking at the consuming public, um, I think finding ways to get to the retail and food service customers is uh, first of all, really important. And that can come through, they're often meeting with processors. I know that we have um, a really strong approach with Chicken Farmers of Canada and CPEPC to meet with um, those companies. So building as much information as possible there, because really they make a lot of decisions um, and their associations have importance as well, like the Retail Council of Canada. So disseminating information through those bodies will reach a lot of of groups or a lot of companies. And then in terms of the consuming public, I think that's a topic we grapple with a lot, which is um, many people want to know that we're doing a good job, but they don't want to know a lot of details about it. So um, we continue to try and increase what's in labeling. We have some more publicly available information for some brands in the marketing materials. Um, but I think that's where perhaps our industry associations like Chicken Farmers of Canada have been most effective um, through the Raised by a Canadian Farmer program, um, that label recognition, and those will, I think, create a double click by people sometimes. So um, it's a balance, it's a tough balance, but it's important that we continue to communicate the great things we're doing um, in, the, in the right sort of moderated fashion that people will continue to build trust. All very true. Um, so we have a question. Um, there are obvious financial and environmental implications associated with slow growing strains, but they have a significant presence in places like Europe. Can you share anything you know about how other jurisdictions manage the financial and environmental concerns to maintain this niche? Mm, another good question. Um, it, to be honest, it baffles me a little bit. Um, I think the first step is that there are more regulatory limitations imposed, um, perhaps not for slow growing breeds, but for other welfare related standards. So there's more of a precedent to um, regulate those strictly as well as say at the EU level have the EU regulations, but then develop even more stringent requirements at the national level, each of those countries. Um, and there's more pricing built in there, I would say, like, I, I think that's a key difference is that um, in the EU and UK, they're able to build in greater pricing increases for those impactful initiatives like slow growing breeds um, versus that's not the standard acceptable market pricing in North America. 
And I did mention the tiered programs. Like that's one way that all of these companies are achieving this. Like I was on a, a call with a company in the UK the other day. They said they're running, I think, seven tiers. And so um, it, it runs the risk of being a bit misleading if you give the impression that the full production chain is like that and it's a small amount. But I think that's really one important way that they're meeting that is by balancing it to a small amount of production that matches the consumer demand for those initiatives. And then from a, a sustainability standpoint, um, I think that it's been an approach of the, the customer base in those countries that that is um, the cost of producing animals in uh, an acceptable animal welfare manner, it will come with those sustainability impacts. But again, that's one of the reasons that that production component is quite small compared to conventional production. So um, it's a balance. And I think the, the market breakdown is evidence of that. Right. Um, I am just looking, we are getting close to the end of our time. So I'm going to put out uh, one last call and we do have, uh, thank you Matt, from a processor perspective. Do you have customers here in Canada that would sustain a differentiated market for slow growing genetics? Hmm. Sustain is an interesting word. Um, we definitely have a lot of interest, like I mentioned, because of all of these companies that have signed on to the better chicken commitment. That being said, I think a lot of companies don't understand completely the financial implications of that. So um, that's where things either happen or they don't happen is when, when you have that discussion. Um, I certainly think there's a small amount of demand that could drive a small amount of production, just whether it's enough to really sustain that, I think is, is the jury's out on that, perhaps unlikely, or it would just maintain it a small amount. Right. Okay. Well, sounds good. All right, seeing no further questions and that we are getting close to your time, I will uh, conclude this portion of the today's session. So thank you again so much, Kathleen. That was excellent and fascinating. And uh, I want to thank also uh, those for submitting the questions for our um, post-presentation discussion.